welcome and thank you for joining us for tonight's event with authors John Hartig and Jim Graham presented by University of Michigan Press. We'll be watching for audience questions throughout the event. If you're on Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of the screen. If you're watching on Facebook, please let us know your question in a comment. You can turn captions on or off using the show captions button in Zoom at the bottom right side of the screen. And we'll be recording the event this evening and sharing it on our Facebook page later this week. This evening, it's my pleasure to introduce John Hartig and Jim Graham. John Hartig serves as a visiting scholar at the University of Windsor's Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research and as chair of the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan's Great Lakes Water Advisory Committee. He's a member of the board of directors of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, and he's authored multiple other books on the ongoing efforts to restore Great Lakes watersheds. Jim Graham is an award-winning journalist from the Detroit News and the former executive director of Friends of the Rouge. We're here tonight to discuss Rouge River Revived, how people are bringing the river back to life, a collection of essays on a waterway with incredible importance to Michigan's past, present, present, and future. Covering about 500 square miles in Metro Detroit, the Rouge watershed is probably best known for housing Ford Motor Company's massive Rouge factory, designed by architect Albert Kahn in the early 20th century and later memorialized in Diego Rivera's renowned Detroit Industry murals. By the 1940s, Detroit Industries were dumping millions of gallons of waste oil into the Rouge, and in 1969, it literally caught on fire, with 50-foot flames burning for around seven hours. After that, many wrote off prospects for the Rouge to ever recover, but community-driven activism and restoration efforts in the ensuing decades have managed an incredible turnaround for the Rouge that once seemed impossible. Today, it stands as one of the most successful example, examples of urban river revival in the country, and its natural spaces are once again enjoyed by thousands of Michiganders each year. John and Jim, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Uh, a real pleasure. Thank you to University of Michigan Press and for all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to start out with a, few, a little bit on the, the history and background of the Rouge River. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just going to get the slides up. Uh, um, well, we just love the cover. Jim and I just love the color uh, cover of the book, you know, with the uh, Rouge in the background and right. and uh, a fly fisherman, no less uh, fly fishing in the Rouge. Who right. would have thought that was possible uh, as recently as 30 years ago. But as Scott said, you know, uh, the Rouge River is a tributary of the Detroit River. And that's part of, uh, that's a connecting channel that it connects the upper Great Lakes with the lower Great Lakes, the upper Great Lakes being Lake Superior, Michigan and Huron, the lower lakes being Lake Erie and Ontario. Uh, the Rouge River is about, its watershed is about 466 square miles. It has three counties uh, that are part of it. In the drawing you see on the left-hand side of your screen, you see the, uh, the four branches, the main, the upper, the middle, and the lower. And then you see uh, Oakland County at the top. On the left-hand side, a little bit of the watershed in Washtenaw County, and most of the watershed being in Wayne County. But in total, there's about 1.4 million people who live in the watershed. It's uh, uh, heavily urbanized, as you can imagine, and industry dominates the lower reaches of the river. Um, for three centuries, the Rouge River watershed was perceived as a source of raw materials to produce goods for society and that provide services to society. Uh, some examples, uh, uh, beaver, uh, you know, beaver were literally uh, expert, extirpated, yes, yeah, removed locally from the European continent, and they came across looking for beaver to North America, and of course, uh, um, the Great Lakes Basin, the state of Michigan, and the Rouge River watershed had lots of beaver, and so they were literally over-harvested uh, to local extinction during the fur trade area. Then trees were cut down for lumber and to facilitate agriculture. Then the river was dammed to support grist mills and hydroelectric power. Um, uh, then over time, as it became 
urbanized and through urban straw, sprawl, 23% of the watershed was developed into impervious surface. That means water can't absorb into the ground. It has, it runs off as storm water into first, into storm drains, into feeder creeks, and then into the Rouge River. So 23%. Ecologists like to talk about a, a healthy watershed with less than 10% impervious surface. The uh, river also became a receptacle for human waste from 168 combined sewer overflow points. In old communities like Chicago and Toronto and Milwaukee and Cleveland and Buffalo and Detroit, they had have combined storm and sanitary sewers. Everything works fine when it doesn't rain or there's no precipitation, but if it rains, it exceeds the carrying capacity of these combined sewer systems and raw sewage, instead of going to a wastewater treatment plant, bypasses the plant and goes in untreated to a receiving water body. So in the Rouge River uh, case, 168 points, combined sewer overflow points on the river. Uh, then Adding insult to injury, a four mile section of the lower river was straightened into a concrete channel to move as much storm water out of the watershed as fast as possible and get it into the Detroit River. Uh, flooding uh, was affecting basements and uh, in, in the surrounding communities. And this was the solution starting in the early 1960s. Then the lower river was dredged and straightened to support industry. Uh, literally a new mouth of the river was created to create a shipping channel. And so that Detroit could become the Silicon Valley of the industrial age. And the, the river literally became an artificial highway at its lower reaches. In 1965 then, uh, the edition of the Dearborn Guide read Rouge called state's most polluted river. Uh, and then in 1969, as Scott said, the Rouge River caught on fire. On the right-hand side of your screen is the last remaining photo of that fire. And you can see the drawbridge on the lower Rouge River. You can see the, uh, the stack and the iconic logo of Ford Motor Company. And in the foreground, you see the uh, John Kendall, the fireboat at the time, Detroit fireboat, trying to contain the fire and get it to burn itself out. Um, but most people didn't care. Pollution was just perceived as part of the cost of doing business. So this kept getting worse and it reached a tipping point. And ecologists like to talk about a tipping point as that point in time where there's an urgent need to take action and that if nothing is done, we could see irreversible harm to an ecosystem. Uh, watershed residents learned uh, uh, firsthand that raw sewage was literally overwhelming the river. Here's a picture of the confluence of the Rouge River and um, the Detroit River. And you see the nice blue color from the upper Great Lakes there of the Detroit River. And that brown uh, mm -hmm. is much of it is um, is runoff off land and some raw sewage in there. And if you look closely, you could even see a few streaks of black, which is oil on the river as well. So um, the tipping point occurred in the mid 1980s on the left hand side of your screen is a picture of the concrete channel and you see raw sewage floating on the Rouge River and a carp in the foreground that has died. Carp are pollution tolerant species, they can live through most situations, they could not live through the Rouge River at that time. So at that time, residents of Melvindale and Dearborn, uh, uh, they had lots of bungalows in their neighborhoods and people didn't all have air conditioning, they would leave their windows open at night. And there was an odor coming in. And residents said, that is really terrible. So they contacted the state and they contacted US EPA and with no response. So they started a petition drive and they got thousands of signatures, put it on the desk of the director of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and the regional administrator of US Environmental Protection Agency in Chicago and demanded they look into it. They looked into it, they 
confirmed that it was not air pollution coming from uh, any of the industries, whether it be a steel industry, automotive industry, a chemical industry, or the Marathon refinery, it turned out that all of the lower rouge had gone anaerobic. That means no oxygen. All that raw sewage coming into the rouge that you see on the left-hand side of your screen was going through decomposition. Decomposition uses up oxygen. There is no oxygen in the absence of oxygen. Something called hydrogen sulfide is formed, and that is the smell of rotten eggs. So it was the rotten egg smell that uh, was part of the tipping point. Um, uh, in 1985, a, a man was also... Uh, recreating on the banks of the uh, Rouge River with his family. And he slipped on the bank and fell into the river. It wasn't very deep at that point. He could stand up, climb out of the Rouge River, dry off and finish his picnic. A day later, he starts feeling sick. And a couple days after that, he dies of leptospirosis or what they call rat fever. Health departments had no choice but to advise all residents of the Rouge River wa watershed to avoid contact right. with the river. Uh, what happened from there was all 48 communities joined forces to develop a cleanup plan called a remedial action plan. Um, at that time, they also did a study, a study of the quantity and quality of these combined sewer overflows in the Rouge River. This study found out showed that if Detroit cleaned up its combined sewer overflows at the lower end of the river and nobody else did, there would be no improvement in the quality of the river. It would take all 48 communities, you know, stepping up to the plate, pulling their weight and doing what they needed to do. And if they did that, you could turn the river around. Um, so the book is a story of the response to this mid-1980s tipping point uh, and how people overcame apathy and are working together to bring the river and its watershed back to life. It is a story that will inspire and give hope to all working to restore and protect watersheds in the place they call home. Uh, it is an edited volume by Jim and myself. Uh, the chapters are written by individually, individuals intimately involved in the day-to-day -day process of restoring the Rouge River. So that's a little overview. And I would like, at this point like to turn it over to Scott to uh, start our dialogue. Thanks so much, John. That, that was awesome. Um, and that, that last section was a perfect segue actually into my first question. And that has to do with sort of the concept of the book and the way it brings together this very eclectic mix of contributors to tell this incredible story of the Rouge recovery. Um, as you and Jim were kind of thinking through how this book was going to come together, did you have people in mind that you hoped could tell these different aspects of the story? Or um, did you know certain topics that you wanted to fit into the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim, would you like to start out with this one? Or Yes, I would. Um, John and I uh, kind of came up with a concept. And then we began to put together the list of the people that we knew ought to be writing these various chapters. Uh, as John has indicated, we met, we, we found people, or we, we selected people who were intimately involved in the restoration, the protection, and the public involvement that's been involved, that's been a key part of the restoration of the river. The book becomes a kind of, I, I like to think of the book as a kind of a celebration of the fact that way back when the Rouge was considered one of the most degraded urban rivers in the country. And today, long, long time coming, the EPA calls us uh, a model for river restoration. A lot of people have been involved in that. And we, we've selected people to, to, to write chapters for the book who had a particular expertise or a particular knowledge and involvement uh, in, in, in one aspect or another of uh, the river's protection and restoration. 
Yeah, I would like to add, just add a little bit to that. You know, there are stories in there. We have a, a Native American uh, anthropologist who talk about what it was like in, in the Rouge River watershed mm -hmm. uh, when Native Americans were living there and um, how they had thought of the river as sacred and they had a stewardship ethic. We then had historians that knew the river and the history. You can't tell the Rouge River story without looking at the history. So we had both watershed history story, but then the, just the story of Henry Ford and the Rouge plant and, and his influence with cottage industries as well. And then we had, you know, civil and environmental engineers and uh, uh, do, showing how it has been improved over time. And then we had uh, people working on citizen science and green infrastructure and, and, and environmental education and how important that is to develop um, a conservation ethic and a stewardship ethic for the for the river. So it's a we think the story couldn't be told with all these without all these wonderful co-authors of the book. Absolutely. I, I want to go back to something that, that Jim mentioned um, that as sort of monumental as the problem was in the 1980s, um, a lot of the progress with the Rouge was at the hands of these grassroots movements, like actual community members coming together um, to address this problem. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of those kind of on the ground grassroots things that are happening um, even today at the Rouge? Well, one of the things that uh, kind of became a signature uh, event was the annual Rouge Rescue, uh, which brought people uh, to cleanup sites throughout the watershed. We were able to average around a thousand or more people per site. Uh, and frequently had at least a dozen sites. So that was a, a big part of it. And back when I began in the 80s, um, it, uh, the idea was that everything that was in the river needed to come out of the river. So we cleared log jams, we pulled out trash, we pulled out millions, it seemed, of tires, even, even cars. Um, it was, it was, it was literally a dump. Uh, that's how little respect people had for the river at that time. Um, as things went along and we learned and progressed, we, we decided that, that, that everything in the river didn't need to come out of the river. We could open log jams instead of removing all the logs. We could, uh, we could uh, stabilize the banks with some of, the, some of the logs that were coming out of the river. Um, we had, we had our, uh, because of my involvement with Friends of the Rouge, uh, I guess I have an, a bias that way, but, and I confess, but uh, we had school-based programs, uh, particularly programs in which we taught the teachers how to train their, their students from third grade up through high school. Uh, in doing water quality monitoring. They would actually go to the river uh, one time a year um, and take water samples and run both chemical tests on them and biological tests on them, finding the bugs, the, the, the microinvertebrates that live in the, in the bottom of the river. Each of those things being able to give us some idea of the water quality. Um, we involved adults in monitoring for frogs and toads, uh, going out in the spring and listening to the calls for the frogs and toads uh, in the, the wetlands around the around the watershed. These, based on on the varieties of those amphibians, uh, we could get a, another indication of the water quality. Uh, and I'm proud to know that as we progressed through the years of doing those uh, quality water quality monitoring, uh, 
the state began to accept our our uh, Friends of the Rouge uh, results and use and use the statistics that we were able to provide uh, for through for their own purposes. Uh, John knows better than I that that the that the real answer to this though was the involvement of all the communities. The fact that every community in the Rouge watershed has a water quality permit uh, is uh, pretty unique. Uh, and it it really signaled a buy-in. And I used to attend some of the meetings of those of those communities when they would join together. And uh, the cooperation was just phenomenal. And if somebody was having a problem, somebody else would pitch in and help them help them come through and get their permit. Uh, it was it became a real quest, and um, that was immensely satisfying for something like that to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's the first watershed in the United States to have all communities with a stormwater permit. That's pretty amazing accomplishment for the watershed. Uh, I guess my favorite story about these these grassroots efforts is that um, the, all the high schools, as Jim said, were involved in monitoring 10 different parameters of the quality of the Rouge. And they would take those parameters and with the help of some you know, University of Michigan students uh, to calculate a water quality index. And then you can imagine you had high schools up in the upper watershed and the headwaters, you had it on all four branches. And you so you had the whole watershed covered and you could see how the water quality degraded as you moved further downstream. Uh, every year, they for, for many years, they had a water quality Congress. And I'll, I'll never forget it because it was just like, it was just an amazing experience to watch it. So they brought in all the mayors, all the elected officials, some business leaders. They were the audience and the high school students were the presenters. So the first thing they did was on a big, long table, line up these one quart glass jars with water from where they sampled. And of course, it was relatively clear up in the headwaters. And as you move down, it got more and more turbid until the, at, the, at the lower end, it was oh. just like like mud and, oh, and, yeah. and, 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 and floating things in there. And so uh, that was powerful because it was students, it was the next generation telling the decision makers what they needed to do. And of course, there were television cameras and what an impact that had of grassroots groundswell of caring about the rouge and 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 that was like really helped move it along um just want to uh encourage any questions that the audience has please do put them in chat um but we'll, we'll keep moving along uh, I, I hope you both could kind of take a, a step back in time and think about um the early years of when the friends of the rouge was becoming a thing um, do you recall what what were the ambitions at that point uh, in the recovery effort? Was it let's just get a place where you can fall into the river and not get rat fever, or what? What did you <laughs> hope could be accomplished? I think that certainly was a, a, a primary goal, but I think also just just a basic idea of, of let's get the river moving. Uh, the back in back when the whole thing began. There was the idea that if if the river could kind of cleanse itself, um, if it would if it could just flow naturally, of course that was incorrect. But uh, I th I think the the important the important thing that Friends of the Rouge was trying to accomplish was public buy-in, public recognition of the problem, and public concern that that, that problem could be, could be uh, resolved. That's why yep. we did so much of the educational type programming that we did, and they still do. Yeah. 
I agree. And then reconnecting people to the water. People didn't even know the Rouge River was out there, oh, you know, yeah. and to give them a firsthand experience, a compelling firsthand experience of what the, the quality of the river was like and and that they could do something, whether it's removing debris or or help with monitoring or or, or whatever the issue was back then, you know, so this just, just getting develop, them just develop a positive attitude toward the river. Yeah, absolutely. To to give them this, let them know it's there. And it's not just an after, it's not just a industrial working river in support of industry and commerce. It's it can be much more than that and provide many benefits, ecosystem benefits to, to society. And and so giving them that experience and opening people's eyes so they would want to learn more. They will want to be more involved. And out of that came green infrastructure and habitat restoration and all, right. all kinds of other things. Yes. Yes, we, the, the Friends of the Rouge is doing a fabulous job of, of continuing the effort and expanding uh, well beyond uh, where we were 30 years ago. And um, I don't know where I want to go with that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I would also like to say the Alliance of Rouge Communities is really oh, yes. important too, to give them, you know, they were, you know, here you have a, an organization working with all 48 communities to, to um, come up with a stormwater plan by sub watershed to monitor the health of the river. Um, and then to begin to uh, make change, to build back some green infrastructure. And of course, they were, they and Rouge River Advisory Council were instrumental in getting lots of money as well for the habitat mm -hmm. restoration. So uh, one of the messages is takes a village, right? Takes everyone doing their fair share to make this, uh, make this a better river and, a pl and improve the place we all call home. And the great thing about our story also is that there are heroes. Uh, for example, uh, John mentioned getting money. Uh, the late uh, representative John Dingle, uh, who was a who was a champion of of environment of the environment in general, but a true champion of the river river restoration on the Rouge River. Uh, he brought he was able to bring. Uh, 350 million yeah yeah 350 million dollars um which was primarily used to address the whole issue of uh, stormwater runoff and uh, this combined sewer overflows um, large containment basins uh, were built in several places throughout the watershed so that when it rains those combined sewers flow into those basins the, the solids drop out and the water then can flow through, the clean water can flow through to the wastewater treatment plant. And when it's not raining, then they can flush the, the solids out uh, through, the storm sewer, through the sewer system and uh, eliminate, eliminate all that raw sewage that was going into the river. They, uh, also, also uh, separating sewer systems. Um, it's amazing how involved, how how critical the whole issue of of sewers uh, were to the to the to the history and to the de degradation, and now the restoration of the of the Rouge River. Yeah, and it took a carrot and a stick, and the stick was. Federal Judge uh, John Fikens yeah, that oversaw Fikens. the wastewater treatment plant for well over three decades. And he could force a community to do what they should be doing, but he gave them flexibility to do it on their own. And if they didn't do it on their own, then he would indeed enforce them. And then Congressman John Dingle came in with some financial incentives of 350 million that leveraged another over $650 million and over a billion dollars was spent on both combined sewer overflows, urban stormwater runoff and habitat restoration. Another of the uh, heroes that's mentioned in our book is uh, Jim Murray. 
who was the uh, head of the Wayne County uh, Department of Environment and took a leadership position in something that became, became known as the Rouge Project. Uh, that was kind of the, kind of oversaw all the uh, efforts by the local communities uh, with their stormwater permits. Um, they had regular meetings uh, in which they talked about problems, they talked about solutions, uh, and he really kind of rode herd on, uh, on all the people who were involved uh, in, uh, in getting the river back in shape. We have some audience questions I wanted to get to. Um, this one from Kenneth Adams. Uh, is the Rouge River polluted in the area that surrounds Rouge Park? And I guess if you could stand, are there different sections of the river that are still dealing with pollution more than others? John? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. No, you go ahead. Please. Okay, uh, yeah, it's 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 not uh, a simple picture, and it it changes with where you are geographically in the watershed, but it also changes over time. You know, so if it's after a um, uh, a storm event with precipitation, you know, there's so much impervious surface that I talked about. And it, the river is like a flashy river. That water runs off in a real a rapid fashion, comes into the Rouge. And so that really limits the, kind of the recovery of the fishery and the invertebrates that live down in the sediments. So um, if it's not raining, there are there are places that it's really in in decent shape, uh, but then there are there are times when it's not so good shape right. as well, you know. So that just lets you know that we have more to do to you know to uh, care for the rouge and and to really achieve a sustainable river system. I know that around Rouge Park. Uh, because it was had it was sort of isolated, you could you could do things and everybody wouldn't see you necessarily. It was a dump. We pulled so much trash and tires and cars uh, out of the out of the rouge that flows through Rouge Park, and I know that that has been vastly improved. Uh, thanks thanks a lot to. Uh, a young lady named Sally Petrella, who's on the Friends of the Rouge staff, but is also a chairman of the Friends of the Rouge Park. And she organizes a cleanup there every year. And they've done a marvelous job of, of uh, really cleaning things up and, and, and affecting the attitudes of the people who live around that area uh, so that it's not being used as a common dump. So Next in a question. lot of ways it's better, Sorry. but not always, <laughs> as John pointed out. Next question uh, comes from Tom Wagner. Uh, how are the seasonal differences in river flow regulated? Does it affect the biota? Hmm. Uh, they're really not regulated in the no. sense of regulated by government in some way but they are controlled by this uh, flows, by this flashiness of the stream. You know, if you have a rainfall event, you get a lot of stormwater runoff and flows increase very rapidly. And then over time, they, they, they lessen. So that, that's a real, um, uh, that's something that's very common in a major urban river but it's something that we need to think about and how do we better manage that so that a healthy river can have the right species of fish that live there, that, you know, the invertebrates that represent a healthy ecosystem living in the sediments in the bottom of the river as well. So um, yeah, that this, this flashiness really is a, a big thing that we're gonna have to deal with. And how do we slow and stop urban sprawl? How do we build back green infrastructure uh, so that we lessen these problems? And that that stormwater runoff doesn't just put water in, in the river, it puts lots of other things, mm -hmm. primarily soil, dirt. And you think, well, so what? There's dirt in the water. But that that affects 
those macroinvertebrates, the little bugs that live in the bottom of the river. It affects the fish, clogs their gills, uh, makes it difficult for them to, to, to live. Uh, and John speaks of the green infrastructure. A lot of that, what a lot of that means is in, a, in many cases, it's, it's just planting, uh, well, planting things they call a rain garden. Uh, putting, putting a garden in your backyard so that when it rains, that garden can absorb water uh, and, and reduce the amount of runoff that's going into the river. Uh, that's one of the things that Friends of the Rouge is doing very well these days uh, in uh, going through schools, churches, neighborhoods, uh, putting in rain gardens, developing swales, uh, all sorts of ways to use natural uh, vegetation to reduce stormwater runoff. And it's working, it's working beautifully. You have both been kind of doing this work connected to the Rouge River for decades now. Um, I, I, I wonder in working on this book, were you surprised by any of the things that you know emerged from your research? Um, were there any factoids that you, you didn't know before? Hmm. What do you think, John? I think it, it, it's always heartening to see how many people now care about the Rouge, you know? I think one of the things is to listen to people talk and say, well, they are now adults and said, I grew up in the Rouge River education program. That had a big impact on me. And now I see the river in a different light, different than my parents did. And that is really, that was a real nice surprise for us to see, you know, um, from my perspective. Yeah, I think that I think the passion of, of many of the people who wrote for us uh, was not a surprise, but it was so refreshing. Um, and it reflects a growing awareness, a growing concern, uh, and a growing realization of the possibilities uh, for the river. Uh, I was, uh, I enjoyed uh, a chapter written by the man who's in the boat that's fishing at the, uh, on the cover of the book. Uh, and he talked about the recreational opportunities on the river. And he loves to canoe and he likes to fish and uh, telling us places, telling us spots where, the, I mean, unlike many fishermen, he was willing to share some of his favorite places to go fish and catch fish and catch trout and bluegill and things of that nature, you know, nice sport fish. So it, that was refreshing and, and, and a bit of a surprise. Yeah. And another surprise was just the response to the Lower Rouge water trail. Oh. Like who would ever think that you would want to kayak and canoe through the lower end, but think about canoeing through the arsenal of democracy through the automobile capital of the united states and just the interest in that and now building you know uh a new kayak launch at the fort street bridge interpretive park you know down in southwest detroit people want to use the river they see seeing it in a different light and that is just a wonderful surprise for absolutely. all of us absolutely we did get a question from Jonathan Crane. What do you think are some of the best sections of the river for kayaking? Is that where you would point, Jonathan, some of those lower sections? Yes. The, yeah, lower, Rouge, the lower Rouge is becoming a, a canoe and kayak uh, trail. And uh, a lot of people are involved in, in making sure that uh, the water uh, runs uh, unobstructed. They're taking out log jams. Uh, and uh, I know that I know that there are fairly regular uh, tours that are being conducted uh, 
check the Friends of the Rouge uh, website, yeah. and, and they can they can. It's a great a great way to get on the river, and a great way. Mm -hmm. to, I've done it a few times myself, and and believe me, you get on the Lower Rouge, out out near the city of Wayne and places like that, and it feels like you're up north. You don't feel like you're in a big urban area at all, and you see wildlife and you hear the birds, and it's it's it really opens your mind and your heart at the same time. It's it's a it's a lovely a lovely experience. I, I highly recommend it. I wondered if you could both talk about whether there are any sort of new projects or new initiatives, new ideas that are being tested out now or soon to be happening that really get you excited, that you think could make a, a really big difference for the Rouge? I, uh, I think that the uh, green infrastructure projects, uh, which are fairly new, are, uh, are a great opportunity for people to get involved. Uh, they're, it, uh, it makes it creates greater awareness of uh, na the natural uh, plants, the native plants uh, of this region, uh, because that's what's used uh, in the rain gardens and in the swales and things of that nature. Um, and as I say, they really work. They're holding back. They're holding back thousands of gallons of of rainwater every time. Every time it rains, mm -hmm. so it's. It, that's a that's a big area of progress. An, another big challenge and opportunity is, you know, we've done some contaminated sediment remediation on the Lower Rouge River over time, but we still have an estimated 350,000 cubic meters of contaminated sediment that need remediation. And we are fortunate in the United States to have this Great Lakes Legacy Act and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, where up to 65% of the cost of that would come from the federal government. But that also means that 35% of it has to come from non-federal sources. It right. has to come from most of these communities, like think of River Rouge and the city of Detroit, don't have discretionary funding for that. Wayne County doesn't have that kind of thing but the state could have that. So uh, what an opportunity. There's about four to five years left of this Great Lakes Legacy Act where we can get substantial money. Uh, the, the, the total estimated cost is about $470 million. And so we can get you know, 65% from the federal government. If we don't act, that is a problem. And we may never see this kind of money again in our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren. So we have to have a sense of urgency to do that. And that is also an environmental justice issue. You know, it's in Southwest Detroit and mm -hmm. River Rouge that they have lived through this, not only the air pollution, but the truck pollution and the, you know, the brownfields, but the mm -hmm. contaminated sediments. Experience throughout the Great Lakes is if you clean up those contaminated sediments, the next thing that happens is you do some habitat restoration. Mm -hmm. Then you reconnect people through greenways and the water trail. So think of greenways coming down from Dearborn all the way down to the mouth of the Detroit River through these communities that, have, that are underserved. Um, what an opportunity. And that's the Rouge River Gateway project. So what an exciting, uh, it's a problem, but what an exciting opportunity to make significant progress in a very sticky issue for the Rouge River watershed. Do you both have some recommendations for um, if people want to get involved and help out with some of those projects, what should they do? I think the easiest way is to contact Friends of the Rouge, <laughs> but uh, their local communities are, off are offering opportunities also. And uh, I think they need to look for those. Uh, 
Go yes. ahead, John. Help me the, out. Yeah, the, the Friends of the Rouge is a great place to start. But then you, Jim also mentioned uh, the Friends of Rouge Park. If you want to get involved in that, you've got the Southeast Michigan Land Conservancy. Oh, yeah. You've got the, uh, you know, um, uh, you've got the, on the, on the south hand side, you've got Downriver Link Greenways. On the north side, you've got uh, the Joe Lewis Greenway. So you can get involved in greenways that are reconnecting people to these waters and also creating mini wildlife corridors and mm. enhancing habitat as well so that there are so many uh, opportunities to get involved. You also can you support your school system wherever you live in making sure these kids getting involved in environmental education for them with a focus on the Rouge River because that's the watershed where they live. Right. I think city councils are a good place for public to get involved with the Rouge River also. If there's an issue, take it to the city council. Make sure that they're involved. Uh, government isn't the answer necessarily, but it's part of the answer. And it can be a big part of the answer. So involve your local government. Involve yourself in your local government. Um, make a I commitment. Think I think that's really good, Jim. I think, you know, you look at the initial 350 million that came down from the federal government that led to another 650 million, and that became the billion dollars to help restore it. Well, we're at a, what that took was a groundswell of support for that funding, you know, um, it, it just doesn't happen by accident. It takes no. everyone advocating for it, everyone talking about what the benefits of that could be. We're at that same point right now with contaminated sediments. We need people to speak out. We need communities to speak out. This is, you know, we all live in the Rouge River watershed. What we do to the Rouge River, we do to ourselves. And people need to see this have this sense of urgency to move on this at this point as well. I think even the federal government, there's issues there. I mean, we need to make sure that our congressmen are ha have a commitment also uh, to the environment, not just to the Rouge River, but the environment overall. Um, and and we, we're, we're seeing efforts to cut funding in those areas. Uh, and we've got we've got to fight back against that. Uh, and that's that's an area where where citizen involvement can be very effective. Yeah. And then we all know that, you know, we want an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We've go. spent over a billion dollars thus far, and we're going to likely spend at, at least uh, another half a billion on this. And uh, do we want it to go backwards? So we need to prevent pollution at the source. We, we need strong regulatory programs like through the Clean Water Act. We need, um, so that's where the governments come in and citizens also need to speak out about that so that we have strong um, laws and we have strong enforcement programs. Right. Well, I, I suspect that your answer to this question will be similar to the response you just gave, um, but what about folks who aren't necessarily in the Rouge Basin, but they have their own kind of environmental restoration efforts in their backyards. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a river that runs by their home um, has issues that they want to help tackle. How, how do they get started? Mm. I'll give you two answers to that question. First of all, uh, if it can be done on the Rouge, it can be done elsewhere. So the Rouge example gives hope. It also, as Jim mentioned earlier, is that we are a model for dealing with stormwater throughout the United States. So how do you come up with, you know, a compelling vision for the watershed that is carried in the hearts and minds of all communities and all people? And then how do we co-produce knowledge together? How do we co innovate solutions and work to get the resources we need. The Rouge has been really a model and example for other watersheds. There is a lot to learn from the Rouge experience. You don't have to 
reinvent the wheel and do it all on your own, you can take some of these best practices from the Rouge and apply it in another watershed wherever you live. I, I know that John and I both hope that the book that we've put together will be some provide some inspiration uh, to those to those other watersheds, to those to those rivers that are still struggling. Um, and to organizations uh, that are working to try to bring them back. Um, I live in North Carolina now, and I and and here in the mountains, uh, there are a number of organizations that are working on the rivers in this area. They're doing some particularly effective work, but uh, I think we I think we have some lessons for them also, and I, I hope that uh, I hope that our book will provide a little inspiration. Both touched on this question a, a bit, but um, Barbara Aylesworth asked, what are some of the biggest challenges facing the river right now? Mm. Well, wherever you go in the world right now, you can see evidence of climate change. You know, you see uh, increasing intensity and frequency of storms. So that is going to make, you know, uh, solving the stormwater problems that much more difficult. That's going to uh, uh, make these aging infrastructure problems more difficult. That means we've got to build more green infrastructure to become more resilient in the watershed. So um, uh, uh, climate change is uh, um, making it more difficult difficult to solve some of these other problems in the Rouge. So it is the most compelling, uh, uh, difficult and challenging uh, problem we face in the 21st century. Yeah. And climate change is, is one of the things that really uh, focuses our, the thinking on, a, on an ecosystem uh, basis. We can't just, uh, we can't just uh, fix the river itself, we have to fix the entire ecosystem, all those things that contribute to the, to the problems that are in that, the, the face of the Rouge River and its entire, and its watershed and its ecosystem. Uh, so, um, John point, John makes a, a great point about the problems that we face uh, with the future as it relates to uh, climate change uh, and all the issues that that involves. Mm -hmm. And we need to teach the next generation. You know, we need to teach like uh, this, uh, the precautionary principle, the ounce mm -hmm. of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, we need to teach um, an ecosystem approach because we are all part of the ecosystem. If, if, if this next generation doesn't understand that, um, they're gonna be at a disadvantage. So we need to incorporate this, this creating a, a, a common vision for the watershed, co-production of knowledge, co-innovation of solutions on a watershed scale, that has to be incorporated in our school systems and, uh, and we have more work to do. And it's amazing how effective teachers, our children can be. Teach the kids and they'll teach their parents. They'll get them involved and it grows and grows exponentially. So that it's an important, important aspect of, of the whole of the future. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, one that comes to my mind is on this sort of long journey of restoration that the Rouge has been on, um, are there any particular milestones that stand out to you that when they happen, you thought, I, I really didn't think that was going to be possible here, um, that, that surprised you or delighted you or something like that? I think the fact that uh, we are unique in the fact that every, every community has bought in, every community has a stormwater management permit and and it's being reflected in the in the attitudes 
uh, of the citizens of those communities. Uh, that that's a that's a major milestone and a, and a great uh, great beginning. Yeah. When you have a over a billion dollar problem to solve, where's the money going to come from? And and we all thought, well, how can we get you know who can be the first one to put money on the table? And and generally it's the federal government and how mm -hmm. could that happen and there were a lot of people including probably jim and me who were skeptical that it could happen but never underestimate uh, the late congressman john dingle oh. and he put it on the table but then he said i want the communities to have skin in the game that they have to put up their share they're not going to get this federal money unless they put their money on the table too right. and so that we all can do this together and and so the first one is we never thought we'd get the 350 million and then the rouge project came out of that then how would how would the communities cuz you know things that you can't see like stormwater and combined sewer overflows and sewage pipes are not the things that people want to fund yeah, but we were skeptical it. that they could do it but they yeah. did it and yeah. so and 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 clearly there's more to be done but there were there are a number of surprises like that along the way One last question about the Rouge, and that is, um, do you both have particular sections of the river that are your favorite, that you like spending time on the most? Well, mine's kind of in the past tense these days, unfortunately, since I now live in North Carolina. But uh, I always enjoyed uh, the area around Dearborn. Uh, I can't remember the name of the park, but there's a big park down there, and it it was always always great to be down by the river there. Mm -hmm. uh, it it just felt to, to me that was the rouge. Yeah, for me it's it's kind of like uh, the campus of University of Michigan Dearborn, and uh, the the Henry Ford. Uh, a state called Fairlane that is now mm -hmm. reopened that is amazing. And you go down there and you can look downriver and see the concrete channel. And then you can stand there and look upriver and you see what a river could and should be. And what an amazing contrast. Um, and it's just amazing. And now they are building there a, uh, a fish ladder. So mm -hmm. the species can get up to their spawning and nursery grounds. And it is just a, it, it, it's just an amazing place that uh, I think everyone would like to see. One of my favorite places also was uh, in the city of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> oh God, <laughs> don't get old. This is hard. Um, out, in, out in Wayne County where there was a, there was a bridge, that, there was a dam that was taken out. Uh, city of Wayne, excuse me, and uh, I enjoy I enjoy that area too. Seeing the river flows unobstructed through there now is is a uh, is a treat. Yeah, then you can go to Greenfield Village at the Henry Ford, mm -hmm. and you can you know see an oxbow that was filled in. It was um, eliminated. I mean, it was only a. Uh, uh, an artifact on a historical map and they rebuilt that into the river and all the habitat that went with it and now uh the henry ford uses that uh for educational purposes you know and it's just uh amazing they have girl scouts and boy scouts and the henry ford academy and the academy right yeah really are involved in it so opportunity every one of these are an opportunity to get young people and families involved in, in, in developing a stewardship ethic. Well, I'd like to, like to wrap up with our last question that we've been asking all of our authors, and, and that's, what have you been reading lately? <laughs> There's a great book on the restoration of the Rouge River. Um, <laughs> I've been, I'm proud of my Scottish heritage, and I've been reading about a, about a man whose name I share, his name is James Graham. He was the Duke of Montrose. He led a group of uh, 
his clansmen and others uh, in a in an effort to protect the Presbyterian Church from being Catholicized, if you will, having bishops and the Book of Prayer, and then, and he became uh, he became uh, he was he was a loyal subject of King Charles the First, and uh, became the king's representative, if you will, in Scotland. So it's a, it's a, that's another inspiring book to me. It's a, maybe it's egotistical, but <laughs> I, yeah. I'm proud to be able to claim that same name. For me, I'm, I'm having a, a fun read. Um, uh, maybe, you know, the name Douglas Brinkley, you know, oh, yeah. he's historian. A, a historian and an author an acclaimed author, and he's written a new book on, uh, silent spring revolution so he talks about the long 60s and what happened in this groundswell of activism through the 1960s and how it you know ended up you know with the wilderness act and it ended up with the endangered species act and then earth day and um so he 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 tells this in very detailed stories about what happened and how it was a catalyst for certain laws and and uh it's a fascinating read thus far really enjoy it can i mention one other book quickly absolutely i'm a, I'm a vietnam veteran and uh there's a book written by my dear friend marvin wolf uh, called they were soldiers and it will will give you a, a, a real insight into some of the people who were engaged in the Vietnam conflict and what they're doing today. And talk about inspiration. There's some great stuff going on. So I, re I recommend Marvin Wolf. They were soldiers. Well, John and Jim, thank you so much for the terrific presentation. Um, again, their book is titled Rouge River Revived, How People Are Bringing the River Back to Life. Um, it is on sale with free shipping. We'll provide information that, on that in chat um, through the end of the month. So please take advantage of that offer. Um, again, thank you so much, John and Jim. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you, Scott. It's been it's been really fun. And and. Uh great opportunity. Thank you for that. Yep. Thanks to everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks very much. Good night. Good night.